On the next Discover Janesville with Yuri Rashkin. Conversation with Janesville Superintendent Karen Schulte. Dr. Schulte answers your questions as we discuss dress code for teachers and students, the tragedy in Newtown, and whether guns have place in schools. Next, we check in with State Representative Janice Ringhand, who was just pre-elected to her second term, and Deb Colsty, who is about to be sworn in as Janesville's newest State Representative. Finally, a conversation with Rock County Economic Development Director James Otterstein about the state of our local and regional economy. Our guest grades the economic performance of 2012 and gives us his forecast for 2013. We also talk about the role financial incentives play in getting businesses to move to an area and when is it a good idea to walk away from an economic development project. All that and more on the first Discover Janesville podcast of 2013 starting right now. Welcome to Discover Janesville. I am your host, Yuri Rashkin. I hope you had an awesome celebration of New Year, and I hope this New Year brings you everything you were hoping for. Um, it's We have a great year ahead of us, and we have a huge program to get through. So we're going to get started with a conversation with Janesville School Superintendent Karen Schulte. Uh, here we go. Dr. Schulte, thank you for being on Discover Janesville. Um, lots of questions. There's been um, a lot of developments with uh, teachers and staff, and then there's also been the recent news events, and um, I'm really appreciate, I really appreciate the opportunity to sit down and, and talk with you about some of these things. Uh, when we first were planning on meeting, um, the, the discussions or lack thereof or discussion off the handbook was all over the news, all over the Janesville Gazette headlines, and so I put on Facebook that I, you and I were going to be meeting, and I got lots of questions for you. Okay. I said, I'm meeting with Dr. Schulte. What would you like me to ask? So I will just go through with these, and feel free to. Um, okay, so first person wrote, <coughs> when will the age-old dress code for students finally be dealt with? I have no problem asking teachers to keep everything covered, clean, etc., but when will students really be sent home for displaying their undergarments and bodies? Um, how do you feel? What is your, you know, because obviously we're talking about the teacher dress code. Sure, what about sure. student dress yes, code? Yes, and, and we do have a dress code for students in their own handbook, the student handbook. And I think students should be dressed appropriately, most definitely. And um, I, I believe principals do deal with it as they see students and assistant principals. Um, I think probably in the high school it's the most difficult and um, as you know, or you probably remember, we also reduced assistant principal positions. And so we have one less in each school than we had before in the high school. Mm -hmm. So it's a, <clears throat> it's a hard issue to really stay on top of. The other issue that we have a hard time staying on top of are cell phones as well. Because everybody has them now. And there are certain rules that kids can follow for appropriate usage. But for teachers, the assistant principals, and principal to stay on top of 1,600 plus kids is not an easy task. But I'm in total agreement. I think the students should follow the dress code. All right. Um, how do you feel about uh, uniforms? Is that, you know, because that seems like kind of the next logical step. You know? Yes. Uh, well, we we have one school, that Tagus Leadership Academy, that has a, a particular dress code. I don't know if you remember this, but a number of years ago, the issue of uniforms came up uh, to a school and board And it seems member. like it's kind of in waves. It periodically yes, yes. comes back up. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there was not interest in the community or with the majority of school board members to to make that transition to uniforms. So I don't see that that's something that's on our front burner right now is to take that on again, to look at uniforms. All right. So I don't, I don't see that okay. in the near, near future. All right. Next question. Why are they not discussing ways to give a better educational experience to kids and wasting time on ridiculous issues? <laughs> Teachers paying for parking, dress codes. Why is the school board involved in these petty decisions and not allowing her to do her job? That would be a question for you. Okay. Um, do you, well, um, I see several questions in, in these several sentences. Um, do you feel that school board is letting you do your job? I do, I do. I, I am very happy with the school board and the support that they've given to me, and I think we're working really well together. Are we spending time on educational issues? Oh, yes, all the time we're talking about how do we know students are learning? Assessments, common-based assessments, the common uh, core standards. 
So I feel like, yes, we spend probably the majority of time on those kinds of topics and how we deliver a world-class education to our students here. I don't think the dress code, though, is a petty issue. I expect us to be a professional organization, and I think for the most part we are, but I think it's very unfair to either hire employees into our district and not tell them what the standard is. You know, Yuri, come work for us, but guess. Guess at what you have to wear every day. Maybe you can wear jeans, maybe not. Maybe if you go to one high school, it's okay, but in another high school, it's not. Why don't we just tell people? And so I, I wanted a standard for everyone. And I gave some examples in the dress code, but it was not an exhaustive list. And I know a couple of people got really concerned about maybe not, you know, wearing a sweater without a collar. Uh, you can't wear blouses anymore. No, no, no. We're not trying to be unreasonable. Most of our teachers do dress professionally. So I want anybody else that comes into our organization to know what that standard is. And if you're just dead set on being a teacher that wears jeans, then maybe you wouldn't want to apply here at Janesville. Then the other piece of this is our administrators. People have asked, well, why don't principals just do their job? Well, what's the standard? Mm -hmm. Principals didn't know. Some principals allow jeans, some don't. And we want that to be the same across the entire school district. Everybody know what, knows what the standards are, and then they will enforce that next year. I don't imagine we'll have much of a problem. It was in the Gazette. It made the front page one day. Right. I never had more than less than 1% of our staff contact me. We had listening sessions. I think we had one teacher show up. I, I don't think it's a huge issue for teachers because most of them are just fine. They just they dress just fine. We will have our um, exception groups, and that was listed in the dress code. Um, the art teachers, we have tech ed, we have welders. And so those groups will, I haven't decided exactly how we'll do that if we gather them all or the chairs of those departments to have a conversation, okay, what's realistic, what's practical for your particular group, and that's yet to come. Do you see this then something that would change throughout, or is this kind of that's going to be like this for the forever and ever? I mean, because, well, I'm just kind of thinking about the standards. What is considered acceptable is, oh, you know, a, right, right. A, oh, my yeah. friend of mine told me when I said that I was going to meet with you, he said, be careful, you're wearing jeans. <laughs> I, said, I oh. had jeans on last Friday. <laughs> Why just last Friday? <laughs> Um, and, and actually, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I have to say this. I love to wear jeans. Of course, I love to wear jeans to work. We have a little thing going here. We raise money for the food drive by having pay to wear jeans on Friday. I participate and I have my jeans on. So I'm not opposed to that. I just want the standard. You know, it goes back to that. Okay. I haven't um, done my research, but do <clears throat> other districts uh, follow, have uh, similar standards, or how does it, other districts uh, handle this? Yeah, that's a very good question. And, and now in this day and age of handbooks, it's different all over. Bill Sodeman mentioned, I think it was Waterford School District, guys have to wear uh, shirts and ties every day. So they're probably on the conservative end. I tried to match ours with Beloit Turner and Beloit because we're all together. We often might have teachers go from one to the other. So ours are similar, but I think you can find all kinds of different dress codes out there today. I, I can almost kind of envision a world where in recruiting a teacher, a school district can say, well, in our schools, we have <laughs> casual Fridays, you know. And yeah, and if that's important, <laughs> that might be a driving factor. I don't factor. know. But is this for all times? No, of course not. That's the beauty of the handbook. We can change it. Let's say we get into next year and we think, this is not right. This just doesn't fit right. We should have done this because we're learning, too. Mm -hmm. We can change the handbook at any time. Okay. Uh, do you feel that the process was participatory enough with uh, teachers uh, where they've had an opportunity to uh, share their views and concerns? Well, I think it was. I have heard from others that they didn't feel like it, like it was. Mm -hmm. So what we did, I did focus groups. We opened up a dedicated email site for people to send questions. We know people don't always like to come out or, or call. So we had that dedicated email site. We had listening sessions, and that's where the board, you know, they really stepped forward. They were here every board meeting for an hour. We had very few people come. And um, let me think if we had anything else. I blogged on it so they could hear what I was thinking about it. 
My cell phone's available. I take calls. I did get a couple of emails, just a handful, but I appreciated the people that did email me, told me their concerns. I was able to email back with them. One person came out and met with me. So I think I'm here. I'm available. Okay. We try and get those answers out as quickly as possible. Great. Um, next question. Ask why people should choose the school district of Janesville over other area schools. Have her explain the possible advantages of going to a larger school district like Janesville. Oh, okay. I love that question. We have the, some really unique opportunities here. In fact, some of the work that we're doing in the area of technology is um, um, forward moving. And we were able, um, by school board approval, last year to hire a chief information officer. And that was huge and that we could really take our level of technology, which I would say was kind of at a medium level, and really ratchet it up to the top. So he's working now with Cisco and PDS and some of the other leaders in technology to see what he can leverage for training for us, for um, more equipment for us, and to really drive home using technology to increase student achievement. Another question we're always asking, how are we using this to make our teaching better, our instruction better, so kids are learning? So um, the, the word in the state, or around the state, uh, before Dr. Smiley came to us as he was doing his research is, Janesville's on the move, and they're moving forward. And I believe we are. And that's one of the areas that we're moving in. Then in a larger school district, you have some unique programming. We have, of course, our challenge program for kids that are functioning in the upper 99th percentile. We teach Chinese, which is different than a lot of school districts. We have a Project Lead the Way, which is a wonderful uh, engineering program or pre-engineering program. So I think there's opportunities. And, of course, if you've gone to any of our musicals or music performances, state-of-the-art performances, getting awards all over the place statewide, so we're blessed really at all of our schools for that. We received three national awards last year for some of our programming, and I think it was five state awards. So I think we're doing a lot of good things in instruction. We are really raising the standard for how we're teaching kids and what they're learning, and we're going to continue to do that because we want Janesville to be delivering a world-class education. Great. Um, next question. When I was in nursing school, my children were in grade school and were learning a lot of the same things I was, which means school seems to be a lot of repeating and running around in circles. We could be actually training our kids with job skills so that by the time they're 16 or 18, they would be able to find a job that is above minimum wage and that does not require more payment to, quote, get ahead. How can I help to get that idea done? And how can we bring into the gym classes simple self-defense classes so all children know a few tricks to keep themselves safe? Sometimes the injuries are not just walking home but also within the home. But if all people know how to protect themselves a little, this country would be safer for it all based on independence and dignity of the individual. Thanks. This is obviously uh, before events in Connecticut um, and tragedy. But... Um, in general, how do you feel that the school district prepares uh, students for success future in, in life so they are not, um, so they're actually training for a job that is above minimum wage? Yes, and I love that question. Um, we just had a meeting about that this morning, so it's kind of funny to have that question today. Career and technical programming. And what are we doing? How are we partnering with our businesses to develop internships? We have youth apprenticeship. And we do some of that, but we want to certainly go deeper. We have the ability, as we work with our business partners, to have students actually leave Janesville with a certificate for welding, for example. We want to go deeper into the technology area. So they are doing exactly what that person's saying, that they can develop the skill sets and take the coursework so they have something already when they graduate mm -hmm. for those that are interested. And then they could continue at a Black Hawk Tech if that's the route they want to go, the technical route. We have a lot of kids right now that graduate with their CNA, their, um, uh, what, do you, what do you call Certified it? Certified nurse's assistant? Assistants, yes, yeah. nursing assistants. So, so they can leave school, be working in that area. They're already certified, and then a lot of them go on to be nurses. And so they continue their it education It sounds like a there. form of AP classes where you have those extra 
things that you would learn in school that go beyond the regular curriculum, right, except right. that it's in skills and trades. Exactly, exactly. And so we believe the trades are very important, and we are doing some of that, but we want to do a lot more. So those kids that aren't as interested in a four-year college can come out of school, earn a livable wage, and then they have paths where they can travel on if, if they want to continue that. We know right here in Janesville, United Alloy, we've all heard it, they need welders. Right. And so we have our welding teachers going out to United Alloy, seeing what is it, what are the skill sets our kids need, you know, and then coming back and, and teaching those skill sets. So we're partnering with And them. I would imagine, I'm just guessing, but I would think the teachers love it because they like to be up to the speed on what yeah. the latest and... Yeah, just what's going on in the industry. In the world. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. That does bring me to, well, I, I guess if you wanted to ask, uh, answer the question on self-defense, is mm -hmm. that something yeah. that you see fitting into the curriculum? We already do it. We've had uh, some courses through the Janesville Police Department, and they have a specific course. Now, it's for women, and they have offered it to our teachers and our older kids. The particular course they teach, I think you have to be 17 and older. So... That's one level that is already available. Could we do more of that? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Um, question that uh, I, I was having a conversation with somebody who follows events in Madison and uh, the education with charter schools and everything, and the person seemed um, really concerned about the state of uh, public education, concerned that we're headed in the direction of this, um, us, us trying to be helpful to businesses, uh, that we eventually become almost like assistants to businesses and we're just providing future workers and then education is completed through apps and online and a kiosk and you check in who you want to be and, and it just kind of becomes a more mechanized and um, less overall educational process but more of a specialized education. Do you see, um, do you see public education moving um changing from what it is currently into a much more of a training you for a specific <laughs> profession, kind of that horror story that we had about communist countries um, that, you know, that uh, you, you know, the government decides for you what you want to be and, oh. and then that kind of thing. And then you're, then you can't change. Do oh, you, no, you no, know, no. <laughs> is, is that a, do you see a balance there between the private sector and the public education? Well, I do. And I, I would not be for the kind of system that you're describing where it's very automated and this is right. your track, Yuri. And Do you, you see it never... headed that way? No, no, not at all. Okay. And as you might know, I just came back from China, and it's so interesting to work with the Chinese because when they view American education, they look at us and they say, you raise such creative, innovative children. How do you do that? And that, to me, that's the American spirit. It's like a dress code. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> might be. So that independence. And... And we are independent thinkers right. in this country, and, and we're allowed that by virtue of our government, too. It's not just the schools. Um, but they want to come and they want to learn from us, because even though the Chinese do very well in math, they're world class in math, they aren't, uh, not everybody, I'm, I'm being stereotypical a bit, but they aren't necessarily able to think out of the box and create an iPad or an mm -hmm. iPod or whatever. You know, that comes from our kinds of thinkers. I never want to lose that with our schools and we do a lot of projects based learning where you learn to collaborate but you think outside of the box and I, I would always want to foster that. Mm -hmm. But then also have strong skill sets in your math and English and reading. Sure. Wow, great. Next question. Go ahead. I bet that's no started to fall. I bet that's the superintendent thinking about calling off school. Yeah. I, I Yeah, because they're all thinking right now. Exactly. Um please ask her, how much money will be saved with all the teachers retiring this spring? These senior teachers who must retire or lose benefits will be replaced <laughs> with young teachers. This will bring in mucho dolares, if I'm pronouncing this correctly. <laughs> the district historically doesn't want to talk about this money. Is Dr. Schulte concerned about replacing these excellent, experienced senior teachers, many of which are retiring, even though they'd rather not? I think that you've had that for several years now. Yes, but this will be the the year. Okay. We predict 90, and yes, of course, I'm very concerned because we lose experience in his history. I've talked to some of those teachers. They've come in and talked with me, and I understand why they feel the need to retire. Things are different in education than how we started out 25, 30 years ago. Um, 
and and I, I can't talk them out of retiring. I understand where they're at. They have to take care of themselves and their family, and they want to retire under this contract. So there's no argument there. But am I concerned? Yes, because we're losing some stellar teachers. It might be, and there's a big might in front of it, because I don't know how it all play out, that some of those folks will be hired back as uh, retired people working for us. We know we don't have to pay benefits twice, so there would be right. some savings there. We do hire a number of retired people already. We've done it for years that come back. They're wonderful in their areas. They want to work. They still have a lot of energy to work, and so it's a benefit both ways. Um, if we don't do that or if we don't do that enough, yes, we have a, we would have a lot of probably younger people coming in. And, sure. yes, there is some savings there. I don't have the cost or the savings right off the top of my head, but we know when somebody retires, we still pay benefits for eight years. So, And then we hire someone in, and we're paying benefits in the salary. Wow. So the difference isn't as huge as one might think. There will be some savings, but that's not where we're going to find our biggest savings. I would also think that this is probably public information, so if somebody is really interested in getting oh, that information could, yeah. out, they could probably request it through an open records or some kind of a... Request. Yeah, a salary certainly are open records. I don't know what my CFO has right now that's in a Just form. Just depending on the energy of this person looking for Yeah, it. but yeah, yeah but you, you could probably figure it out. Yes, and, we're, and we certainly are looking at it. He is. Okay. <coughs> um, this seems to be an, another question on dress code for students. Yes. This seems to be, yeah. Why aren't the students held to a standard for appropriate dress as the staff is? Please elaborate what distra distracting and inappropriate attire is for a student and enforce the policy that exists. You have clearly made the decision to allow kids to wear whatever they want, just be in school. Poor compromise, and every day there are violations in both the middle and high schools. Sad. Well, I don't know if I have anything more to add to what yeah, I said before. It, exactly. we do, they do try and enforce it. It's very difficult to, to get every kid. I was a principal at one time. I had clothes in my office that I would give a student that was inappropriately dressed. I'd say, here's a T-shirt, put it on, <clears throat> or if you have something else. They always had something else in their locker. <laughs> they didn't want to wear my clothes. So, you know, I wonder um, if students are just preparing, <laughs> just in case they run into problems. Mm -hmm. okay. Some students, you know, they leave home in the morning looking one way, and they get to school, and they change their dress as well. You, you know, know I'm, I'm thinking from a parent's point of view, if you're trying to determine what, you know, and as, as I'm, you know, my daughter is only 11, but already there's choices being made every day. <laughs> Um, is it good idea for maybe a parent to talk to a principal at school or something like that and get some specific ideas, suggestions or questions answered, or how do parents go about this? Oh, sure, yes. If parents have questions, they can speak to anybody, a school administrator, a guidance counselor. They would certainly be open to doing that. It, it is difficult if you go to movies, if you watch TV. The dress there isn't always so appropriate. Well, it's, and, and that's varies. what our kids, yeah, right. our kids look at, but... We do have a standard in our district. You know, do we have this all taken care of and everybody's dressing the way they should? No, I know they're not. Um, I have two high schoolers with me now that live in my home, and, um, you know, sometimes they have to go back and change what they're wearing as well. Um, historical question. Would you have liked the dress code when you were in school rather than making decisions that have no issue with the budgets? Was there a dress code, was there a dress school, dress a, code when you were going to school? Oh, as a student or as yes. a teacher? As as a I, I can only imagine this has to do with when you were a student. Okay, yes. When I was a student, I went to two different high schools. One was a large urban high school in Cleveland, and there was um, a number of inches that we could have our skirts above the knee. Now, I grew up during mini skirts and hot pants. So I'd leave home and I'd roll up that skirt. Believe me, I did it too. And I remember the guidance counselors running around with rulers. And they would actually measure. Wow. And they'd make us go to the office and take our hems down if we had to. So, yes, I did. I grew up with the dress code for students. Maybe like following Warren Buffett, they're just doing economics research. <laughs> yes. Then I ended up my last year of high school in a small private school. And they had an unusual dress code, but I actually enjoyed it. They had knickers for kids. Blue corduroy knickers and light blue blouses, or you could wear a corduroy skirt, the boys' pants. And everybody wore the same thing, and we were all fine and happy. <laughs> all right, um, next question. Why do they, and it's, you know, you have to presume that uh, 
just because somebody says this is how it is doesn't mean that it's necessarily how it is. Why do they continue to ignore bright mm-hmm. kids that learn in different ways and then treat them as if there is something wrong with them? We don't need more aids. We need instruction that masters a subject. Um, I, I guess I have a hard time understanding this this one myself because there's all the charter schools, there's, there's the challenge program. Mm-hmm. It we seems like more, this district actually does more than Yeah, others. I think we do more than most. We have four charter schools. And as we said, we have the challenge program. We have TAG advocates. You know, are we doing enough? Are there some kids being missed? It's possible, of course. So if a parent has a concern, they should go to a teacher or a guidance counselor because I would worry that we have a a student sitting in a classroom maybe bored, maybe not being challenged, but somehow not being picked up by us. But, yeah, I think we have multiple opportunities for kids to try different things here. Okay. And I would imagine ultimately if people have questions, they can reach out to you? Oh, sure, of course. Um, this is great too. And <clears throat> these, uh, what is her fondest memory of Drake University? <laughs> A Drake alum. <laughs> right. Oh gosh, I have so many. Um, um, Millie's, and they'll know what I'm talking about. Um, the the track, the relay, the Drake relays that they do every year. That's just uh, known all over the nation. Um, I was a, a music student then, so the music department, FAC, where we would all practice for hours, days on end, the library, Cole's Library, um, just such a beautiful campus as well, and um, great professors. So I have many, many good memories of Drake. I wonder, I'd love to know who that is. Right. Call me. That's right. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, you blog. I, I'm, I do I'm, blog. I, 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 I'm a blogging just, maniac. I'd love to give you as, as many compliments on that as <laughs> you know you. possible because I think it's it's great and it's important mm-hmm. because you are uh, basically letting people know what you're thinking. Yeah, trying to. Yep. Um, so I think anybody that is listening to this should make sure to read Dr. Schulte's blog. And how can they find it? Thank you. I'm going to put a plug in as well. Go to the website, and if you go under the superintendent tab. You can click on that, and then you'll see a, a spot for a blog. But I think even more importantly, if they would sign up to get the blog on their email, so you see it every day, you can see what the topic is. If you're not interested, you just delete it. But I think occasionally you'll see things, and you'll think, oh, she's talking about the dress code again. I want to hear about that. Or right. she's talking about uh, programs for gifted kids. That's one I want to make sure I read. Because you don't always remember to go to somebody's blog site. You know, It's kind of hit or miss. So if they sign up, they can get the blog to deliver to their email. I think we have 1,400 employees. I have about 120 people signed up to get the email. And I keep saying, come on, come on. This is the best way I know of to keep you really up to date minute by minute right. about what's going on. So I just glanced at it today, and, and it, you know, it said what meeting you were at and what happened at yes. the meeting. I mean, that kind of stuff is really, if you're following the district, is priceless because you know, unless you're a public elected official or work in the administration, you're never going to be at all the meetings that take place. But if you're curious, here's an opportunity to, to know what's going on. Exactly, exactly. Thanks for mentioning it. I yeah, appreciate absolutely. it. Um, well, um, I guess uh, before we wrap up, I definitely want to get your reaction to what happened in Connecticut and, and the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary. Um, as a parent, it's... Uh, it's it's just one of those experiences that makes you look at schools differently. Yes, yes. Um, h- how is the district handling it? How do you feel that any responsibility that falls on you in, in this situation? Because obviously crisis management and preparing and drills is something that's yes. part of any school district. Um, but how do you feel? That, well, we've been talking so much over many years now about how the world changed on 9-11. Yes. And it kind of feels like the world has changed after what happened at Sandy Hook Elementary. Okay. And and how do you, well, you being on the front lines, how do you feel? Yes. Well, it changed with Columbine as well. And now, you're right, with Sandy Hook. First of all, a horrific, horrific event that happened at a school. How these parents will ever cope and really deal with the tragedy is, is just, you know, uh, so difficult to even imagine. You certainly wouldn't want anyone to ever be in that type of situation. I was so pleased that the first phone call I got after this started to roll out and we found out what happened there, 
was from Chief Moore. He called me right away. He wanted to um, let me know, and, and I know this, we talk often, but immediately let me know of the support of the Janesville Police Department, reminding me of the things that are already in place, such as we have active, sh active shooter drills right in our buildings. They train. So our police, if they ever were called to a building, they already know the buildings. They've already trained in those buildings. We have blueprints. We do, you know, so many things to drill and to practice and to be ready. Uh, Chief Moore was here today. I had a meeting with him, and mm -hmm. we're going to we're talking more about other things now that we can put into place to ensure the safety of our students. Are you expecting some changes to take place? I believe we will uh, probably come up with some some additional things than what we have done before. Okay. So. You know, it's so important. Neither one of us ever, of course, want to be at the helm where something like that happens, and we could have done one more thing or something different than what we're already doing today. So we're putting our heads together, and we're talking, and we're thinking through that again. This particular tragedy, you know, we know the gunman shot out the window of the school to get in. And um, so just tracking, learning about what exactly happened, and that's more on the police side. That's their area. Mm -hmm. And to, to think about it and to look at what happened and then to talk together, school, police, law enforcement, what are we missing? Are there other things that we can be looking at that would ensure the safety of our students? And I know parents of children that are in any school have to be thinking about that. Are our schools safe? And, you know, the the statistics of something like this happening in a school are probably still small. Right. But if it's your child, if you're a Sandy Hook parent, it doesn't matter because right. you are one of the statistics. And so we need to look at everything over again and, and think about what we're doing. It's my hope through all this. We had, through the time I've been an administrator, some very important things and programs in place that I hope that the federal government will reconsider. We did uh, two different kinds of trainings. One, there was the REMS grant, which we had about five years ago, readiness emergency management training. So we could get all the players together, fire, police, ourselves, and do really deep training in our schools. Well, that takes time. That takes money. And the grant allowed that. We had a national school safety expert come, Ken Trump, and he actually did training with us. And that was great, but that's five years ago. And so some ongoing training, you know, throughout the nation, schools need that. The other thing that we had in place was through, um, oh, it was an organization that, oh, the Missing and Exploited Children. Hmm. And they trained uh, administrators, police chiefs throughout the nation on how to watch and monitor kids of concern in your schools. Because we know that we have kids being brought up in violence and, and those kids could cause problems in schools like Columbine. So we had that training, we all worked together, and we still continue that. We have our Safe Schools program here, and it's all the schools in the county come together. We have our police chiefs, we have David O'Leary, a district attorney, um, we have juvenile probation, and we talk about kids of concern, because if in, they're in our community, they may be transferring to Beloit or somewhere else, Clinton. And so we have kids on our radar screen that we watch. So we have those nice things in place, but we do need that support and training to keep that going. Okay. And, uh, well, I'm not going to ask you about your stance on uh, gun policy, but do you feel that um, the guns belong in schools in a sense that uh, is, would, would it have made a situation safer, in your opinion? You know, just because this, this is, seems like a conversation we can't really avoid. Sure. Here's my own personal opinion. Uh, I love that we have police officers in schools. They are the ones with the guns. They are trained, and they are the ones that should have the guns. Now, we have them in our secondary schools, and we rely on them. And when I was an assistant principal at Marshall Middle School and we had our school resource officer, Kevin Olin, I, I felt like we had that extra layer of protection because he was well-trained. He would know what to do if an emergency like that came about where somebody came into the school with a gun. And I was at Marshall when Columbine ha happened. Mm -hmm. So we were watching it all on TV. So 
if there are guns in school, it should be attached to a police officer, and I think we're, we're really fortunate to have them at, at least at our secondary schools. Great. Karen, thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. This is very enjoyable. Discover Janesville, and uh, my name is Yuri Rashkin. Deb Kolsky was just elected to her first term as, uh, well, she is the newest state representative representing the 44th district and uh, most of the city of Janesville. Uh, we connected to catch up to see how she was doing a couple of weeks ago during the middle of a snowstorm. Um, and uh, on Monday, uh, Mrs. Kolsky is going to be sworn in. So she is right on that cusp of uh, being an elect and being an actual representative. So um, here's our conversation. How are you, Deb? I'm good. I'm ensconced in my house with blowing snow outside, so it feels kind of fun not to have anything to do. Yeah, it's kind of nice when all of a sudden the weather just says, you're done. Yep, that's, that's good for me. All right. Well, uh, welcome back to Discover Janesville, and uh, we're just doing a recap with uh, pretty much who I've spoken with uh, Representative Jorgensen and Ringhand and Amy Loudenbeck. It was a great conversation, um, Good. and it's wonderful to speak with you again. How? Are, uh, well, we know the weather is out there not good, but you're getting the weather outside is frightful. It <laughs> is. It truly, <laughs> truly is. Uh, apparently, I didn't know that that's such a happy song. That's such an interesting weather. <laughs> But no, it it is a very happy song. Are you looking forward to your uh, swearing in? It's on January seventh. You know, I, I I'm very excited. Um, it's it will be. I, I even have relatives coming from. My mother's coming up from Texas, and a sister from South Dakota, and and maybe another one from Nebraska. So, I'm very excited. It'll it'll be fun, and also my just my my immediate family will be here. And uh, what do you expect to happen afterwards? Because uh, you know, there's all it, now it's getting down to business. So, what are you expecting? What is well, first of all, first week will just be a huge learning curve on you know how to get things done um, in the assembly, and so that the first week is just taken up with classes or you know seminars and et cetera to teach us how to get up to speed on um, how to get things done and. That will be fun and interesting, and um, probably pretty taxing. What do you? And then after, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> after just, that, um, yeah. after that, we're. Um, I've spoken with um, Representative Barca, the minority leader, and I'm. I think I will. Um, I'm not. I can't say for certain what committees I'll be on, but it looks like I'll probably be on four committees. So that will. Um, that will keep me running, but. Um, I think I'm up for the task, and it's probably a little easier for someone that lives close to Madison to be on a, a, a committee or two more. So I'm looking forward to that because I like to be kept busy. So Great. Um, yeah, you're kind of having a really, really fresh perspective of what it feels like. Um, so do you plan to be in your office holding office hours, or how uh, do you prefer constituents uh, to get in touch with you? My office will be 8 North as far as I know, and... Um, but we don't have telephones yet, so people can get a hold of me there. But it'll be, um, it's an office right in the north doors. Um, as far as office hours go, um, I will always have, um, Steve Engelbert is going to be my legislative aide. We will always have somebody in the office. And, um, you know, I hope to get back in contact with anybody that has a concern or message within 24 hours. Um, so I'm always available. Um, through my home phone also until we get an office phone. And I hope to have office hours here in Janesville at different, different and various um, locations, and we haven't set any of those up yet. So um, 
I just hope to have them all over town so that I can hear from the people of Janesville. Excellent. Now that the election is over and uh, now it's getting to business, what what do you expect your day to be like? Uh, what do you expect to be able to accomplish? Um, how do you see yourself, uh, Deb Colsty, with everything that you are as a person fitting into this new team of uh, 39 Democrats but 99 representatives? Um, you know, that part will be hard. Um, you know, we all have kind of philosophies that, you know, we'd like to see enacted, but I know that I'm only a part of a whole. You know, it's kind of like being on any board, and I'm used to being on different and in, in various civic boards. So my role, I see, is bringing my philosophy to that group and then um, working diligently to make sure that we get things done and without losing sight of what, I mean, each of us wants some specific things, but usually there's something that can be had in a compromise. And, and so I think I, I bring that. I think I'll, I hope I'll be a calm, human voice, and um, that we'll get things accomplished that will be, you know, for the greater good of the citizens of Wisconsin. And I think I'll be, um, you know, if I sit on three or four committees, I think that will take a lot of our time, and that will also be a learning curve because I have, you know, some of those areas I'm, whatever I'm on, I'll, you know, there will be things that many things that I don't know, and I, I will have to learn, you know, kind of from scratch. So I think I'll be busy reading a lot of information. Well, you know, the, all I can figure is that far less able people than yourself uh, managed to, to make it through, and so I'm sure you'll be just fine. Um, you know, go ahead. It's my, one, my one upside is, you know, I, I like to be kept busy, and I love learning new things. So this will give an, me an opportunity to have both, right? Be busy and learn lots of new things. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, yeah. Let me ask you this. I've, I've asked this question of every representative that I spoke with, so it would be only fair that um, I ask you this, even though you're just coming in and uh, the rest have been there for a little bit of time. But Forbes magazine came out with ranking of different states, and they rank Wisconsin as 42nd um, in terms of best for business, however they define it. And uh, so it obviously doesn't look good for Wisconsin. And what Forbes had to say is, quote, Wisconsin's economy is driven by manufacturing, agriculture, and health care. The state's also the nation's leading producer of cheese. The Badger State adopted the slogan, Open for Business in 2011, erecting signs along the state border. The results have been middling at best, as job growth is projected to be second worst in the U.S. through 2016, end of quote. Um, Representative Colsey, Representative Elect Colsey, what do you feel needs to be done in Wisconsin to improve our ranking? Um, what are your thought, thoughts on this? Well, I mean, a couple. First of all, I think that we need to, you know, um, small businesses represent a vast majority in the 90% of all businesses, and they represent a majority of um, employees. And I think that we have done little or nothing for uh, small businesses, especially since we've taken away some of the income out of um, middle-class citizens that would be spending the money. So I think we need to work on small businesses. Also, you know, you keep hearing about the skills gap, and um, they say there is ready, some ready employment when we, you know, um, level that gap. So that's something I'd like to work on to see if, you know, what the validity of that is and how we can address it. So... I just think those are a couple things, you know, and and we, I think, you know, like I said, small businesses will be vital in um, the state of Wisconsin. That's, I think that's one thing we've missed out on. All right. Um, I think that the skills gap is a great uh, subject right there because that is something that I've been talking about and many, many other people have as well. Um, what do we do to close that gap, especially when it seems like funding for technical colleges is getting cut? But at the same time, um, I spoke with uh, Superintendent uh, Schulte, and and uh, she is uh, looking for ways to work more with businesses and to uh, create those opportunities for students coming right out of high school. Um, what role do you think state can play in all of this mix? Well, you know, I always, during the... Um election I kept saying we had a self fulfilling prophecy coming true when we when we try to guide you know, when we judge schools by how they do on um the core curricular 
um, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And um, then we take funding away and say, but you'll still be judged on those core curricular um, classes. You know, so uh, to some degree, we the importance that's been placed on technical classes has been lessened. And having said that, I think it's going to be essential that um, it's the stake in private industry that work to close the skill gap. I mean, there will be some responsibility for private industry to, um, you know, tell us their needs, but also to have, you know, have have a, a, a share in um, what the expenses will be in getting that done, especially for very, you know, um, specific job skills that they'll need. Is there anything in conclusion that you would like people to know, uh, your constituents, anybody else listening to the program? You know, I just... I want everyone to know that um, I I want everyone to feel that they can contact me for anything. I mean, I hope that's one of the things I do best is constituent services. So I just want everyone to feel free to contact me in the Capitol, to call my home, to send an email or whatever they need to be. And, um, you know, I hope that I that we provide a great constituent service. Deb, thank you so much for being on the program. Thanks. You know, Janesville is has done well to have you in Madison, and uh, I look forward to speaking with you soon. Thanks, Yuri. I appreciate it very much. You're listening to Discover Janesville. This is Yuri Rashkin. We're going to complete our uh, checking in with state area, uh, let's see, area state legislators with a conversation with Janice Ringhand. Uh, Janice just got um, re-elected to her second term, and it's always a pleasure to talk with her. <laughs> Janice, um you won re-election, you uh, won convincingly. Why do you feel uh, now after the district has been changed and, and your boundaries have changed, you still have done as well as you have? What do you credit that to? Well, we've put an awful lot of work into it. We spent a lot of time out knocking on doors, and uh, that's something that I have found to be successful throughout my campaign you know, whether it was at for local office at the city level or, you know, running for state office. It's just very successful to go to the people in their own area. Knocking on doors is a very successful process to be elected. And um, I believe that played a huge role in it because we were very, very active. We were out doing doors, and boy, <laughs> seven days a week most of the time, even in the heat this summer. Yes, that that is something that I think you're actually known for is, is your... Uh, in intensity with which you go and knock on doors and knock on doors and knock on doors and it and it pays off. Mm -hmm. It does. It definitely pays off. Very good. So, what are you looking forward to this session? Because the Democrats remain in a the minority. There's 39 seats, and and what difference do, are you hoping to be able to make uh, um, in Madison this year? Well, as you've probably heard, too, the governor and uh, Robin Voss, who will be the majority leader, have both stated that they want to work together across the aisle. Well, I'm going to take them at face value on that and hope that they mean it, <laughs> quite frankly, because I am more than willing to work across the aisle. And we still have some serious jobs issues that need to be addressed. One of the things that I've talked about a lot and that I'm very serious about is um, – taking care of the uh, education gap, the skills gap that we know we have right now between un unskilled workers and jobs that are available in local manufacturing. And it's just more high tech than what most people are trained for. And I have stated all along that I'm very much in support of providing an education to fill that skills gap. And I still want to see that done. And I know that Black Hawk Tech has been actively pursuing that along with private industry. So they're looking at more of a public-private partnership to get that accomplished. And I'm very much in support of that and uh, looking forward to see what we can do about it. And there are some uh, issues there because we have the technical colleges that lost a lot of funding in, in the latest budget. Right. Um, how do you, do you see that uh, trying to close that gap or, or what can technical colleges do? Well, that's one of the things that I've heard that with the surplus that we apparently have on hand at the state level now, that more money will go to technical schools. So I hope that that is exactly what happens, that enough funding will be put into programs of this nature so that people get the training that they need to get jobs to become self-sustaining and you know self-supporting. So I'm really hoping that that will happen. So that's something that I will advocate for is uh, greater funding for 
vocational schools and also just a push at the high school level and even junior high level to get the uh, industrial arts types programs back into the schools more active so that young people have a better understanding of an early understanding of uh, the job skills that can be had out there that provide good jobs. All so right. that'll just, you know, it kind of rolls together between education and jobs. Forbes magazine just recently came out with a story in the ranking, and they're placing Wisconsin as 42nd in a nation, actually dropping from 40th in 2011 as far as best states for business. And the rankings they're using are derived from a series of criteria such as business costs, labor supply, regulatory environment, economic climate, growth prospects, and quality of life. And uh, um, here's what Forbes had to say about Wisconsin. They're saying, Wisconsin's economy is driven by manufacturing, agriculture, and health care. The state is also the nation's leading producer of cheese. The Badger State adopted the slogan, Open for Business in 2011, erecting signs along the state border. The results have been middling at best, as job growth is projected to be second worst in the in U.S. through 2016, um, Representative Ringhand, what, what do you uh, see as a way out of this uh, bottom of the ranking? What, what can that's we do? That's really unfortunate. Yeah, that's really unfortunate that we went backwards in this instead of forward. But I think with all the disruption that's been out there, um, it doesn't. It's not conducive to a good business climate. We need to calm things down and get back on track and show that we're sincere about working to get jobs, you know, creating those jobs. And, you know, you mentioned the cheese factories, which are in my district. The majority, well, I shouldn't say the majority, but a great deal of them are in my district, current district in Greene County. And I have visited those factories, and uh, they are going great guns. And there's a good future for them. And I don't want to see anything happen to stop that, you know, right now. And with the redistricting, I will still have three major cheese factories that I know are going strong. And I think that uh, getting that skills gap closed will be one of the things we can do to help promote our manufacturing jobs along with cheese factories. But we need to get rid of all the uh, disruption at the state level. We need to start working together and do it very clearly and let people know we are the adults in the room. We can work together. All right. Now, when you're talking, you know, it, it's very interesting that you're bringing up the cheese factory because um, I think from the Forbes point, Forbes point of view, they're highlighting, uh, you know, yes, this, you know, the official, you know, what is the state known for? Yes, we're known for cheese. But you're actually in a district where th that is like a lifeblood of uh, of communities is you have a right. large cheese factory. So our cheese future is looking bright. Yes, it is. Yes. At this point in time, I would say yes, because most of our cheese factories have expanded. Wisconsin artisan cheese has become a very popular commodity around the country, and uh, people go out of their way to get Wisconsin cheese. They know that it's top ranked, and yes, it is a very strong market. And I, I'm not sure where Forbes is getting their information saying it's not a strong market, if that's what they're indicating, because it is. It's very strong right now. Okay. The thing that could hurt it the most would be that if the price of feed gets so high because of our drought that it affects uh, milk production. So those things all go together where the drought affects the uh, feed that's available and then farmers will sell off their cows and not milk as much. So that would be the downside for the current cheese factories. Now, some of the hotter issues of the day, and uh, it's, it was kind of interesting because I recorded interviews with uh, other representatives before the events on Friday morning, and um, you're the first person, that, you know, a southern representative that I'm speaking to since the events in Connecticut on Friday. Do you see something happening in Wisconsin on the legislative level that, uh, or is this reforms that are going to occur and dis be discussed or going to happen on the federal level? Uh, to do, try to do something about gun violence or mental health or any of the number of issues that that were affair, that uh, were brought into play by the tragic events on Friday morning. Well, I know the federal government's most likely going to become involved, and just uh, having read some of the reports in the paper that indicate there has not been a major increase in these types of tragedies over the last few years that they've been ongoing. They don't see them being more frequent now with the looser gun laws, but I would hope that people would realize that having 
a little bit stronger standards for getting guns. You know, right now the concealed carry law requires absolutely no training in Wisconsin. And I disagree with that. I voted against that bill, and I believe the bill is here to say we are going to have concealed carry. But they need to make it a little bit tougher to get guns, you know, so that people at least demonstrate they know how to handle guns and know how to handle the consequences of using one. So I would hope that maybe a little more stringent rules and regulations will be put into place. But um, I don't know that it will happen with the uh, current majority. I just don't see that happening. Sure. So at least some more education to to, to train right. people in using guns. All right. Um, right. On the other hand, uh, the governor seems to have backed off from the idea of abolishing same-day same voter registration in Wisconsin. Do you, mm-hmm. well, uh, do you believe it? Do you expect uh, something to be where maybe uh, legislation gets passed, but he doesn't sign it and it becomes a law because he didn't veto it? Or how, how do you expect the same day to hold up in Wisconsin going forward? Well, I hope it doesn't happen. I hope they don't change that. I hope they leave it as it is because people have registered on the same day, election day, ever since I can remember. And I think our clerks are offended by the fact that someone's saying it's difficult for them because it's part of their job. It's not difficult for them. And they're doing what they are supposed to do, registering voters. I'd like to see it left alone, and uh, I hope that it will be. But... um, you know, it's hard to say at this point. I, I'm, I'm hopeful that the antics of the last session won't repeat themselves this time, but I don't know until it happens, I guess, on that one. All right. What assignments do you have in the in this coming session? Which uh, committees are you on? If you want to talk about that a little bit, that would be great. I don't know that yet. Um, I'm hoping to hear from Peter Barca today. We each put in a request for up to six committees that we were interested in, and I haven't heard back yet, but I did request uh, something in the job creation area. I did uh, request jobs, economy, and mining, and uh, small business. The, the committees are different this term than last term, so some of the ones I was on last time are no longer there, such as rural economic development simply isn't a committee right now. So jobs in the economy would be a close equivalent and small business development, I asked for veterans affairs, I asked for again. I served on that last term, so I'm hoping to be reappointed to that. And um, I asked for the health committee because I was on a Stoughton Hospital Board of Directors for seven years and have a very strong interest in um, health care. And rural, excuse me, rural, urban and local affairs is another committee I was on last term and would serve on again. And that just basically deals with local government issues if they arise because of my experience in local government. So those are the ones I requested, but I don't know at this point which ones I'll get. I should know by the end of today or tomorrow, but don't know right now. That You know, that is interesting for me, and maybe this is something that you can shed light on for folks listening, because um, when I spoke with Representative Loudenbeck, she already knew her assignments, but she is in the majority party, does that make a difference of when the assignments come out, or how are those, yes. you know, what's the politics yes. of that part? Yeah, it makes a difference which party you're in, because the majority party is the one who aligns all the committees and who is the chair and the co-chair and how many members will be in each committee and what the makeup is of Democrats and Republicans and typically it's not exact but pretty close to two to one whatever the majority group is they have two members for every one of the minority group so that's kind of a a rule of thumb it's not exact so yes they would have um, the organizational efforts all accomplished before we get the information so they would know what committees they're on and um, like I said we were requested to put in our requests last week in which we did and so we're just learning now what committees will be on. Well, and maybe that's one of the ways in which uh, there could be some more cooperation between the parties is at least communicate about what committees and assignments. And, and uh, Now, wh- what about your office? Because when I uh, had the, the pleasure of visiting you up at the Capitol last year, you were up at the very top there in, 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 a, in a small <laughs> office because you were a freshman 
and in a minority party. Right. Do you, do, is that going right. to change? Are you still sitting up there, or how does that work? No, nope, that <laughs> that is changing. That's part of the pecking order, <laughs> and uh, with uh, 14 new freshmen coming in on the Democratic side. That gave us quite a bit of latitude to pick out bigger offices lower down. So I'm actually going to be on the third floor in 321 West, and um, it's a bigger office. I'm looking forward to the move uh, just to have a little more room. So uh, the freshmen more than likely will be on the fourth floor. Most of the sophomores will move down to either the first floor or the third floor because that's where the majority of our offices are. And there again, that's a pecking order because the majority picks all their offices first. So they pick what they want and then we get a list of what's available and they go through it by seniority and pick the offices that are available when our seniority level comes up. So I picked 321 West. It has nice windows and a you know, much more spacious than what I had. So the freshmen, as it goes down the pecking order, will get the smaller offices last. So right. I'm moving. I, I'm I moving just, down instead of up. <laughs> I just love the, the, the office politics of, of every office. Um, <laughs> I, I remember I was uh, reading in a, in a paper a while back about a freshman United States senator uh, and people were saying, wow, he seems really popular. There's always people mingling by his desk. And uh, the columnist that was answering the question said, well, it's because everybody's got their job, and it was the job of this junior United States senator to get all the snacks. So all the senators <laughs> would come up to his table to get their snacks. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> There's the reason for the popularity. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, well, is there anything that you'd want to let uh, listeners know that they should have information about or anything you wanted to touch on before we uh, wrap up our conversation? Well, I'm looking forward to coming back for an, another term. Um, obviously, the district's a little bit different, but I enjoyed getting to know people in my new portion, and uh, those people that I retain from my old portion, part of my district, still looking forward to working with all of them, and uh, hopefully we will have a little more cooperation across the aisle and really get some serious matters resolved. We know that the health care, whether it's, you know, the... Affordable Care Act, we know that will be coming our way. I'm not sure if there's room to have that overturned so we can set up our own health care exchanges. That's something I'd like to see happen. But, uh, you know, we've got a lot lot that needs to get done, and I'd really like to see us accomplish that, to get people back to work, to get their health care solid, and uh, just turn our entire state around so we're, our economy is much better. So looking forward to working with everyone. Well, uh, Representative Ringham, Janice, thank you so much for being on Discover Janesel. Best of luck to you and happy holidays. Well, thank you very much, Yuri, and the same to you. Listening to Discover Janesville, this is Yuri Rashkin. As you can uh, probably guess by now, economic development is subject uh, near and dear to my heart, and so I particularly appreciated the opportunity to sit down with Rock County Economic Development Director James Otterstein for an in-depth conversation about uh, what 2012 has brought us, and in fact, uh, to kind of take a look at the last several years and uh, take a look at what may be in store for us in 2013. How are you? Good. <laughs> are uh, things crazier in December or are things slow down in December? You know, it really depends on um, three Or is it all things. kind of a project driven? You know, I, I'd say it depends on three factors. Number one, it depends on um, the political economic climate at the national and state level. If things are stable, uh, then our activity level is strong. If things are unstable, then things get to a grinding halt and the activity level drops off uh, the proverbial cliff. Uh, the other thing that impacts things is weather. If we have a mild um, winter 
then the construction season mentality is extended. So folks are thinking about doing projects sooner than later, so consequently they want to go ahead and position themselves for uh, the thaw or to take advantage of the nice weather as they have it. And then last but not least, if there's a variety of projects that are moving very rapidly through the process, the end of the year can get real busy with people trying to wrap those up before the end of the calendar year. There's, um, you know, fiscal considerations for that. Right. There's obviously tax implications. There are board uh, and personnel implications that, that people have to deal with. So it really depends. And so this calendar year, as an example, it's gone from one end of the spectrum to the other. It's gone from being real quiet to being extremely busy. And it's been extremely busy on certain projects that uh, have been moving their way through the hopper, as we call it, or the pipeline, and those that need to have certain milestones hit, either an internal milestone or an external one that's bestowed upon them, i.e. a construction schedule that they have to adhere to. Those um, you know, are dictating how things are moving. But in terms of the overall pipeline, it's been quiet, and um, the quiet has been driven by what's been happening at the federal level. You have a lot of companies and investors, regardless of size, regardless of industry sector, that are extremely skittish about making certain types of investments. Um, and so time will tell. Usually the first quarter of each calendar year, and particularly the months of January and February, are a barometer of how the entire year is going to be. So if those two months are sluggish, that means the entire calendar year is going to be sluggish. So time will tell. Well, you've been doing this for a while, so... Yeah, I've got a bit of perspective here. I've uh, been doing it in this marketplace since 1998, um, and I came here in May, so I've only got a half year's worth of data for 98, but every year <laughs> thereafter, I've But after that, you've got it all fixed. That's, that's awesome. Um, kind of disappointing that uh, it's quiet, but it is what it is, and you've, it's, you've been seeing it's been quiet since, what, 2008? Well, honestly, since 2008, there's... There's certainly been some rather stark contrast been going on in the economy. Arguably, 2008, uh, most people pegged that as that was the beginning of the Great Recession. And so from 2008 to 2010 was extremely challenging and uh, difficult, not only for our particular marketplace, but obviously for the upper Midwest and, and many locations throughout the U.S. and arguably across the globe. Since that time frame, um, there's been a lot of really good stuff that has happened and a lot of good progress on a variety of fronts. And those fronts generally represent uh, kind of our economic dashboard, the economic indicators, uh, the gauges that we monitor and, and keep an eye on. So from 2008 to 2010, I mean, the story's been told 100, right. 100 times six weeks right. Sunday. Things weren't good. So all the right. indicators were going in the opposite direction. Pick an indicator, it was bad. There was uh, very little excitement or optimism in regards to when things were going to turn around. Well, the tail end of 2009 and then certainly ushering in 2010, things started to turn, albeit incrementally. So since 2010, moving forward to the current date where we're at right now, at least in Rock County, there's been a remarkable turn of events in regards to these indicators, and more importantly, there's been consistent trends in regards to how these indicators are moving. And so those indicators fall in the following areas. Unemployment, uh, bankruptcies, foreclosures, vacancy rates for industrial, large commercial properties, uh, hiring activities from local companies, investment um, you know, activities, uh, price points for residential real estate and, and kind of the um, transaction activity associated with that, you know, days on market and those types of things. So uh, the Rock County sales and use uh, sales tax collections, you know, monitor that. Uh, so all of those indicators from 2010 to moving forward have been moving in the right direction. And so the trends are extremely positive. So quarter to quarter comparisons things continue to move in that direction. So here's a real prime example. Uh, if you look at our sales tax collections over the course of you know, the last two years or even back to 2008, you're going to see some peaks and valleys with that. And obviously, as things got extremely volatile and tight in the local market, people were spending less. And I think that was indicative of what was happening nationally as well. 
well, fast forward to where we're at now, calendar year 2012, three out of the current 11 months that we have data for are three of the highest months that we've had since the sales tax been enacted. And if you look at the returns from this recent Black Friday, you know, Thanksgiving holiday shopping. You already have those season, numbers? We already have those numbers. So things are moving in the right direction. So on the sales tax side of the equation, uh, unless something strange happens during the month of December, we should meet or exceed the $10 million kind of threshold mark for annual collections. And that's a that's an impressive figure to hit because that was pre-2008 crash. And of course, you know, nine and 10 were lower than that and, and, and getting back up to that level is uh, I think a pretty important barometer in terms of at least the local consumer confidence around here. If people are feeling confident about their jobs, if they're feeling confident about their ability to make their payments, invariably they're gonna go out and spend more. And of course, that could range from big ticket items to vehicle sales. And uh, the Gazette's dashboard that Jim Lute puts together indicates that vehicle sales numbers have been up. A variety of reasons for that. Maybe there was special financing. Maybe there was inventory reduction activities going on. But at the end of the day, regardless of what the reasons were, people are either buying vehicles or they're not. And you're only going to buy a vehicle if you feel comfortable with your employment position. Um, and, and so I think, arguably, if you look at all these different indicators together, quarter by quarter, you could come to the logical and intelligent conclusion that things have improved, things are getting better, and therefore these indicators are moving in the right direction. And then, you know, from an aggregate standpoint, you know, I, I think what happens is is folks folks have a difficult time coin, uh, perhaps taking all this information and, and putting a local context to it. And, and I think um, one of their barometers they use is, well, you know, how many people are employed? versus those that are unemployed. And let's face it, unfortunately, in any given economy, you have um, an unemployment rate that's either going to be, you know, at, at one particular place in time or another. And um, economists refer to that as a cyclical unemployment rate. So historically, the U.S. cyclical unemployment rate was pegged at maybe 3.5% plus or minus. Arguably, given what's happened with the Great Recession moving forward, that cyclical unemployment rate has probably moved up to about 7%. Again, I'm not an economist, but I think probably after the fact, you know, everyone's going to take a look at all these figures and and settle on probably, yeah, 7%, maybe 7.5% is the new norm in terms of the cyclical unemployment rate. And so if you look at any given calendar year between the national rate, the state of Wisconsin rate, and Rock County's rate, you're going to see separations in those numbers. Our rate and the national rate, um, depending on what calendar year and month, they could be in lockstep all the way through. And sometimes it's less than a percentage point difference between what the federal rate and what Rock County's rate may be. As an example, uh, the most current data that we have, the federal rate came in at 7.5%. Uh, we happen to be at 7.1%. On the other hand, the state rate is at 57 And again, that's a consistent and historical trend that you'll see with the state of Wisconsin's rate historically has been lower than the federal rate, federal rate and historically lower than our rate as well. And again, that comes back to the, the composition of the industry sector that each particular... That's uh, interesting. So you're has. saying we're actually more representative of the nation than of the state? Mm -hmm. and, and again, I think it's just because of, you know, again, the industry composition sure. uh, with higher concentrations of manufacturer-related employment um, versus at the state level, there's uh, more of a diverse economic base. If you look in the Fox Valley over in the Chippewa Valley, uh, certainly the Madison and then the extended Milwaukee area, you've got a larger concentration of, let's say, IT-related positions and, and companies that are involved in that type of industry sector. Uh, obviously, the diversity of, of the economic base in Rock County has been quite visible. Uh, what used to be dominated by the automotive-related industry, not just GM, but GM and the supplier network, now has been replaced by the healthcare industry. So if you go back and look at 25 years ago, uh, the percentage of the local employment base that was dedicated towards manufacturing, and then you slice it another segment to the automotive sector in particular, it's almost direct correlation to what the healthcare industry represents right now. And so it's an interesting shift that you, you see all across the nation, but uh, certainly it's more dynamic, you know, in our particular area because of what's happened, you know, since 2008 versus other locations.
we, we clearly shifted from automotive to healthcare. Well, w the entire nation has shifted from a manufacturing goods, from a goods producing to a service orientated, okay. you know, economy, and certainly healthcare is a prime driver of that service-based industry. Uh, the flip side is is certainly healthcare, in particular, uh, generally commands much more of an economic impact than the traditional retail service-based environment as people think about, you know, easy categories or boxes to fit industry segments into. And, of course, just like healthcare or any other industry, uh, you've got kind of the entry-level positions and then you've got the top-rung positions. And although we haven't done any deep statistical analyses, and I don't know if we're going to be able to get our hands on it, but uh, there are some observers that might look at our sales tax collection activities and say that the reason that our sales tax collection activities have remained strong and are continually increasing perhaps might be attributed to the fact that the healthcare segment of our economy is not only strong, but it's growing. So what I'm hearing is that you're very proud of the, the sales tax and what it has been able to accomplish for the county, but it sounds like the, the, a lot of that the funding for it is coming from health care services. Um, is that fair understanding? Or is that kind of split all over? I, I think it's split all over. That number of $10 million, which yeah. is an impressive number, where, where do you feel that coming from? Well, I, I think if you look across the board with uh, individual household savings rates, those numbers have increased. Uh, the the amount of uh, credit card debt that the average you know household is carrying has has been reduced compared to what it was previously. Right. So I think there's a combination of factors. The other thing that's going on is if you look at um, you know average weekly earnings for the private sector in particular in our area, the numbers are starting to go up. So if you look at quarter by quarter, obviously 2009, 2010, the numbers were pretty lean. In 2011, they started to ratchet back up. In 2012, based on the data that we have, numbers are, are improving. So, so you're looking at the sales tax as a representation of fiscal health of the our, our general population because it's a very direct representation of what's going on economically? Could be. And again, I'm not an economist, but uh, there's probably a host of reasons, but I would argue that this is one of several reasons that are coming into play. People are bringing home more take-home pay, and... Um, perhaps they're electing to spend more of that take-home pay here locally versus outside of the area than they might have done pre-2008 as an example. And again, there's, there's a ton of variables here and, and we don't necessarily have access to all the information. And again, I don't think anyone has been able to do a very deep statistical dive to say, without question, these are the reasons why this particular outcome sure. has happened. But I think logically and intuitively, you could make those connection points. At least on the face of it, it seems to make sense. Right. It's logical. Um, so you said that, you know, you're not an economist uh, a couple of times, and uh, that probably is a good transition to the fact that you're economic development director for the county, which means that your job, is, as I see it, is to promote county and attract, help attract businesses to county industries. And even though the economy has been in tough shape, uh, you know, you, you were involved and very much involved when in putting together our county 5.0, working on Shine Project. Um, how do you see all, you know, because it's not just us trying to, you know, bring things in, it's also us you know, creating, making efforts to uh, see more attractive. How do you uh, see that those efforts are panning out now that it's at the end of 2012 and um, obviously, there's bigger pictures in place, as you mentioned. I, I can't argue with it that until the overall economy improves, it's hard for us to be a shining beacon, although we do try. Um, but how do you see your efforts and overall economic development efforts? Because it's not just you. It's, it's Beloit and Janesville and everybody in private industries working together. And, and it, I would say that at least on that level, that seems like it's been very effective because there is, it, it's not like everybody's sitting in their bunker there's a lot of interaction. But what are the results that you kind of, how would you grade the results? Well, if we were going to grade it according to a traditional academic, um, you know, grading skill, I would say that uh, we're, we're hovering anywhere between, you know, a, a B plus to an A minus. And, and the reason that I say that is because we have come from 
a starting point that was light years behind where we're at right now in terms of the level of cooperation, in terms of the level of commitment, in terms of the level of meaningful collaboration. Everybody can talk about partnership. Everybody can talk about working together. But yeah. those that actually make a commitment, roll up their sleeves, make it happen, and ingrain it in their daily work activities and use it as a measurement on how good uh, their particular individual game is, per se, and, and the things that they're doing to sharpen their ability to be more competitive. All of those have um, certainly been expanded exponentially, and they've been expanded exponentially in a manner that is cooperative, in a manner that is consistent with the bigger picture. And, and what we've maintained all along is that we're stronger together versus being um, you know, weak independently, and uh, the fact that you know we sink or swim collectively together makes a big difference. And the fact that we have meaningful dialogue and meaningful collaboration, the fact that we're all doing things in concert, albeit a little bit differently in each particular zip code, but the outcome is aligned with what the big picture is. That's what counts. And so, consequently, I think we've been real successful at um, elevating our economic development program and more importantly our value proposition that we provide not only to existing companies but also to new prospective companies and investors as well as the entrepreneurial environment. Uh, I think that has been elevated to an entirely um, much higher and, and more value-added position than it ever was in the past. And um, given the number of tools that we have at our disposal right now that we didn't in the past, certainly helps separate us from the competition out in the extended marketplace. So I'll give you a couple examples. Um, the Gazette did a nice article within the last probably three months on kind of our toolbox that we have. And historically, at least those in public policy, have thought about our economic development toolbox in the context of incentives. What do you have for money programs to help facilitate a project? That is a stereotype. It is a stereotype. And, and, and it is an important tool in the toolbox, but certainly it's not the only one. And so what we've done on our end is to say, okay, what are the non-financial programs and non-financial tools that we can have at our disposal that helps improve our competitiveness out in the extended um, economic development arena? So here's a couple just brief examples. First and foremost, we've created an interactive online cost calculator, and that cost calculator right now has two distinct but related modules. One is a state and local tax module, and the other one is a uh, labor module. So invariably, right now, uh, whether you're an existing company looking to expand or your prospective investor, whether you're located two states away or across the globe, you can jump on our web page, get into that cost calculator, and input what your anticipated or actual costs of doing business are uh, from, from a, a tax standpoint, Basically, it's collecting sales information. Where's the sales attributed to? How much is state? How much is federal? What other states are you doing businesses? So on and so forth. What type of industry sector do you represent? What's the ownership structure? Are you an S Corp, C Corp, LLC? You know, those types of things. Uh, basically, you input all that data and then you hit calculate. And all of this is done in real time environment. And essentially, you get an output on the spot on what your anticipated costs will be based on your input that you put in, as well as what your projected costs may be if, in fact, those figures may change, you know, in year two or year three, again, based on the input that you put in. You don't have to be a CFO to run this cost calculator. It's essentially, uh, you know, a lot of boxes that you put the input in and, and uh, you hit calculate and it's right there. And the nice thing about it is all of that, all the data that derives that cost calculator has been vetted and validated by Baker Tilly. So it's not suspect. It's true, accurate data. And in addition to that, on the labor side of the equation, same concept. You're a company that wants to come into the marketplace and let's say uh, you're going to have 25 employees. Well, we ask you to identify what job categories those employees fit into, how much are you know, on the office and admin side, how much might be in the production side, uh, what portion might be warehouse, and then you actually pick from job classifications. You put the number of employees in in that particular classification, and it draws out of our 2012 wage and benefit survey, puts those numbers in there, and it also draws off of workers' compensation, uh, unemployment insurance tax calculations, and again, you hit calculate, bam, you get 
all your calculations on what your staffing costs will be for the year. Is there like it's, a website where people go to? Yeah. Uh, in all these uh, tools that I'm going to reference here, Yuri, they okay. all can be found at rockcountyalliance.com. And okay. the cost calculator in particular is found in the business resources main drop-down uh, menu. In, in addition to that, we built uh, a virtual building portfolio. We went out ahead and pre-designed six industrial and warehouse uh, buildings that have been optimized for our shovel-ready industrial parks in the county. And basically we've taken... Um, you know, footprints as small as 59,000 square feet, as large as 700,000 square feet. And we've created complete building portfolios that have spec sheets, renderings that include curbside and aerial, site plan, as well as office plan, and uh, floor layouts. And, and again, these are all consistent and uh, compliant with local site plan and state building codes because we used Angus Young and Associates here in town to develop those, and certainly they do a lot of business here, not only within Rock County, but obviously statewide and, and out of state as well. And so we use that as a tool to help facilitate conversations, to help identify, you know, somebody believes they need 30 acres. No, tell you what, we've got a footprint right here that fits on 10 acres, as an example. It meets all your needs. It can be expanded by another 50 or 100,000 square feet, which we have built into that portfolio. And oh, by the way, if you need to have the ceiling heights adjusted or if you need three more docks or if you have to have a bigger office footprint, we can generally have those plans turned around within 48 to 72 hours. Again, there's a value-added service that we're doing on our end that our competitors aren't doing. Private industry is doing it. When you say competitors, what do you mean? Other like economic other? development organizations, okay. whether at the state, regional, or local level. Nobody else is doing these things, to our knowledge, at the same level, at the same scale as we are. To help facilitate the value and the utility of that virtual building portfolio, we've went ahead and basically have had three of our industrial parks certified as shovel ready. And essentially what we did is we uh, partnered up with a credible third party vendor in the industry and they went ahead and evaluated our parks based on uh, roughly a 200 point variable analysis. And essentially it, it broke it down everything from um, utilities to uh, infrastructure to environmental to ownership to, you know, all those different components into that. And they basically evaluated and measured that against a hypothetical project. And um, based on that analysis and based on all the due diligence that we've done, we've essentially squeezed about six to eight months worth of research and due diligence that a private third-party vendor would have to do to come in and do a project here. We've done it all. It's all categorized, all available. So you walk into City Hall at Beloit, Janesville, Edgerton, and then Milton, first quarter of 2014, 13, excuse me. You'll be able to have all that information right there at your fingertips. And, oh, by the way, if you don't want to make the trip to the City Hall, you can get online and grab it right now. So all that information is currently That's available. That's a pretty huge leap forward. Because it's huge. Not only does it speed up the review and analysis process, but it also takes into account staff considerations. Let's say I'm out of the office. Let's say that our entire ED team happens to be out of the office because we're on a uh, business development trip in another marketplace. Somebody happens to make a phone call to City Hall. They're asking a lot of questions. The clerk or whoever answers the phone in the planning department, all they have to do is to ask a couple questions. Number one, do you have access to the Internet? If so, here's where you need to go. Or number two, if you happen to be right here in the building or in town because you want to stop by, Jump up to the third floor. We've got three sets of three ring binders ready to go. So it accelerates the review process. It makes the information exchange more fluid and efficient. And last but not least, it's all been documented by third party. So it's not that we're saying, hey, they, you know, we have all the information that's accurate. It's been stamped. It's been reviewed. It's been pre-qualified by a third party. So all the information has taken all the guesswork out of the process. Nobody has to uh, question whether there happens to be any environmental or archaeological areas of significance in there. Already been delineated, check the box. Uh, they don't have to warn about uh, the soil conditions and if it has the right compaction for uh, the type of structure that you know wants to be built there. Check the box. Already been done. They don't have to worry about the permitting processes 
or uh, the review, review process because they've already been delineated and the fact of the matter is, is these shovel ready parks essentially create about a 30 day window that somebody can walk in, close on a piece of property, get early start permits on that piece of property and invariably take title of that property within about 30 days plus or minus. Very few locations can match that speed. And so one of our value propositions countywide is our ability to respond and to accelerate the review and decision-making process and our ability to move their project at the time frame that they want. And uh, as, as you know in any business, time is money. And the fact that we can squeeze all that extra time and due diligence out of the process certainly goes right to the bottom line and to help you know, accelerate the, the project here locally. You know, it, it looks like a very impressive effort, and I've seen it from both sides and uh, the, the amount of work and everything you just described. It, it is impressive. Um, I'm trying to figure out how does it compare with a bag of money on the table, you know, like come to us, here's a bag of money, because it seems like it's not just a stereotype, it's it's like a trend and and uh, and we're all always historically are competing with other states who have been more generous in incentives. Now uh, they're talking about a venture capital bill. Do you, do you seeing something that's going to happen in Madison that's going to help us here as far as attracting businesses and the kinds of businesses we want to attract? Let me answer your question first by addressing the bag of money. Um, true, resources and cash do make a difference, and incentives are tiebreakers. They either help pull a project into your area that invariably would not have necessarily considered your area, or they help keep a project uh, from going to a different location because you've been able to put resources on the table. Now, the other side of the coin is that those resources need to be right-sized and they need to be flexible and they need to have sufficient street value to make them workable for the project. So um, here's a prime example. If a company is offered a pile of money that happens to be representative of Wisconsin income tax credits, but they're a new company that doesn't have any income tax liability and may not for year three or five or seven because it's a brand new product or a brand new technology they're bringing to market, or if because of the structure of the company, let's say they're an LLC, so it's a pass-through. Uh, so the resources are going to be distributed among the members of that LLC. That type of pile of money may not have the same street value as, let's say, a grant or, let's say, upfront money in the terms right. of a low-interest loan that may be structured as forgivable, assuming that certain milestones or performance standards are met. And so um, you have to kind of peel back the onion layers on each incentive package to really delineate What's the real value proposition here? Invariably, the name of the game is the more front-end loaded you can do the project, the more flexibility that you have with the resources, uh, the better off that your package is going to be. And, and the reality is, is even despite the lean economic times that uh, several of our competing states are enduring right now, incentive projects have gotten larger. And I think it comes down to the point that uh, it's very, very difficult to keep and grow companies right now, let alone bring new investment in the area. So in order to be considered best in class or to be competitive, you've got to be able to bring the checkbook, and you have to be able to bring a checkbook that can be applied to a variety of industry segments. We've been doing a lot of research over the last three and a half to four years for lack of a better word, we call it the book of deals. And basically, we've been monitoring and tracking by region and by industry sector the types of projects and the type of incentive awards right. uh, that are out there. And the numbers have gotten larger. And they've gotten larger um, based on certain industry segments and certain in types of projects in, in respective industries, um, i.e., you know, biotech, uh, advanced manufacturing, whatever it may be. Uh, some of those obviously are commanding larger incentive packages than, uh, let's say, uh, order fulfillment warehouse, unless that order fulfillment warehouse represents about 2 million square feet of certain nameplates in the industry, and then obviously the dollar amounts adjust accordingly. So uh, incentives aren't going away. Uh, if anything, they continue to be um, one of the five variables that make or break a project, and the other variables come into play are uh, 
you know, geography and location, i.e. supply chain, uh, talent or your workforce side of the equation, uh, the infrastructure, both in terms of the traditional road, rail, airport, but more importantly on the IT side of the equation. And then um, last but not least is the overall business climate of your particular location. And so I'll transition that into the second part of your question in regards to the state of Wisconsin. That, that may be even think that I had more questions on that other part, but uh, we, we can cover both. Sure. Uh, the state of Wisconsin has uh, taken some rather bold initiatives uh, since the governor, since Governor Walker has, um, you know, come into office in terms of adjusting the state's regulatory, its fiscal, and um, its environmental, and, and last but not least, its its overall, you know, cost of doing business perspective. As part of that, the venture capital bill, which unfortunately has been stalled up at the Capitol because of competing uh, ideas and what that venture capital bill should be, there seems to be at least a little more sense of urgency and a bit more sense of uh, collaboration on what a workable bill could be. Is it the be-all, end-all to the state's economic development uh, program? Of course not. Is it an important step and an important tool that goes in that overall toolbox? Right. Yes, it is. Uh, proof will be, you know, in the pudding, as they say, in terms of what actually gets generated out of the uh, legislature and, and hopefully approved by Do the government. Do you wait on any, any of these? Like, you know, if I only had this, then it would allow me to do something else, or you just kind of go, if it happens, it happens? Well, the reality is, is there's a variety of constituency groups, uh, much like any public policy issue that weigh in, and those constituency groups at times uh, form coalitions that support one particular initiative, or, or they continue to be fractured. So uh, our main constituency group that covers our economic development interests in terms of the state of Wisconsin goes by the acronym of WEDA, W-E-D-A. Uh, we refer to it as WEDA without the checkbook because there's also the other WEDA with an H that has the checkbook at the state level. So in any event, the Wisconsin Economic Development Association is our statewide trade association that represents um, an eclectic mixture of public and private economic development interests statewide. Venture capital bill is one of several legislative and policy initiatives that are on the 2013-2014 agenda. And uh, there's a variety of uh, coalition members and, and other partners that, uh, you know, we collectively are hitching our wagons together and uh, attempting to circle those on, on some of these public policy issues and attempting to have influence on the shape and nature and the extent of what eventually gets put into a bill and then hopefully gets approved and signed off by, you know, the governor. So. Venture capital bill is is one particular initiative. Another is, uh, initiative that we're going to be working on has to do with uh, tax credit portability, as it's referred to. Again, using the analogy of, hey, I'm offered a tax credit award from the state, but I can't use it. Uh, is there a way to create a market to transfer and or to sell those? There's a bill that's already been introduced. Uh, had some committee hearings, some very lively committee hearings uh, this last legislative session. There is some support, I would argue, for the ability to transfer. So you're the company that doesn't have a sufficient tax liability, but you will at some point in the future. You happen to be leasing space from me, the landlord, and I happen to have a tax liability. I can pay you my ahead, rent with you a go tax ahead credit. And, you go ahead and pass your tax credit coupon to me. Right. I use that tax credit to draw down your lease rate, as an example. Right. Very simplistic. Uh, example. I was actually thinking work. of a simpler analogy. To me, it's like, you know, if, if we imagine like there's a pizza and we can have a coupon for price off or we can just say this pizza is free or, you know, big part of this, you know, and I'm just trying to figure out is there a point at which it becomes not cost effective to give away all the pizza you can possibly make because, all right, there's product being made, but there's no revenue coming in because it was just, you know, the, the goals kind of got confused. Um, is there a point do you see at which incentives and all of those become um, it, it's just not worth it anymore? Well, I think each project has to stand on its merits. And in contemporary times, there's a larger emphasis on the type of capital investment into the project and, more importantly, the type of employment positions 
created and or retained by the project. Historically, uh, incentives used to be based on jobs, just strictly jobs. Now they're based on the type of investment, the type of jobs, uh, the supply chain connectivities that a company has right now within the state of Wisconsin. You know, are they buying product? Are they using services from, from other companies, particularly uh, those that are making product or creating technology that's being used by, right. you know, another entity? And if those metrics warrant consideration and if they represent certain industry segments that you're either trying to grow because they have significant upside, both in terms of uh, the employment side of the equation and in terms of technology adaptation, and more importantly, in terms of their ability to draw other investment in the area. Case in point, nuclear medicine. So yeah. North Star and Shine happen to represent two prime examples of, of companies that have products that they're working on, emerging technologies, but a rather important emerging technology for the entire U.S. And oh, by the way, the fact that they'll both have their plants located right here within Rock County warrants uh, the type of assistance that those projects have received to date and will receive, assuming they hit certain milestones all the way through. So if you want to advance certain areas of the economy, uh, you have to be willing to make investments in those areas to, to help facilitate those. We'll be back with the second part of our conversation with Rock County Economic Development Director James Otterstein. And you're listening to Discover Janesville, and this is still Yuri Rashkin. Uh, we are back with part two of conversation with Rock County Economic Development Director James Otterstein. And this is what I, one of the things I really love about doing this show and this podcast, because if the conversation is going well and uh, the person has a lot to say, and is in this case, um, James and I have spoken for actually about an hour, um, I have the opportunity to play this conversation for you um, and uh, let you see really it's possible to make this conversation better, sharper, and prepare it for a podcast to just the best, I don't know if it's possible to do the best 30 seconds out of an hour-long conversation, but, you know, what I think is really important is to get across everything that happens throughout the conversation and really get the understanding of context, um, how the conversation flows. Um, and uh, really, um, I think these are just great, and I'm really glad to have you along for the ride. And uh, let's go and head and listen to part two of conversation with Rock County Economic Development Director, James Otterstein. I'm seeing two things. First of all, sometimes you have to be probably willing and able to walk away from a project. And, and uh, at the same time, it requires economic development professionals to continually increase the expertise to evaluate these projects, to come up with appropriate milestones, to, to figure out how to, you know, to move the project forward. The reality is, is we say no more than we say yes. We don't have resources to provide to help move a project from point A to point B each and every instance. So because we have a scarce amount of resources, excuse me, we need to be very diligent with how those resources are being applied. Uh, the level of accountability, transparency, as well as performance standards that are placed on contemporary incentive packages is at a much higher and deeper level than it ever has been. Right, wrong, or indifferent, that's how it is, and I think it's raised the collective um, utilization bar across the board in terms of there is an extra level of due diligence and then some that needs to go into evaluating whether a project warrants using scarce public resources. Cool. Let me just look at my notes, make sure that I, I didn't miss anything. But um, Oh, uh, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. okay. Um, so the two things that I had was the skilled labor and if there's anything else that you wanted to cover. So let me ask you about the skilled labor issue. It seems like it's been in the news and con subject of conversation over and over probably more than a year now. Do you see that situation uh, taking a turn for the better in any way? Well, I think uh, the, the skilled labor discussion is going to be ongoing, not only in our 
particular area, but across this nation, and it's a function of changes within demographics. People uh, obviously getting older, leaving the workforce, new people coming into the workforce, uh, and it also is a reflection of what's happening with the industry sectors. There's a lot of changes that have been going on. Everyone wants to focus on manufacturing, but let's face it, there have been arguably sweeping changes that each industry segment over the course of its life cycle, some longer than others, have adopted to make themselves uh, more profitable, more sustainable, and more insulated from um, you know the the variables that often you know are always attacking. So whether there's changes in the fiscal climate, whether there's changes in the the financial markets, whether there's changes in the environmental side of the equation, uh, fuel prices in the energy markets, how do you insulate yourselves from all those volatile shifts that perhaps happen at different points or, as we found out during the Great Recession, a lot of those happen at the same time. And so the domino effect happened. So a lot of these companies have basically implemented a variety of changes to help insulate themselves, and, and arguably they've figured out how to operate extremely lean. they figured out how to uh, employ and, and deploy more uh, technology within their processes. Uh, and then obviously some of those companies have reached their capacities and they need to expand. So consequently, then the skilled worker shortage comes into play as they need to backfill for attrition. Uh, people leaving the workforce and they've got to fill those with new people coming in. Do the candidates have the right skill sets to plug and play as they say and hit the ground running right away or do they need some sort of um, additional hands-on or classroom-based training to make them skilled enough to be in that position. And given the legal and liability concerns and the amount of money that companies have wrapped up in their product and their brand image and more importantly in their personnel. These are very, very top of mind considerations that HR personnel have when they're trying to find people to come into work. Uh, can you take you know, somebody who has a pulse and just bring them into an environment where you have multi-million dollars worth of equipment that somebody has to be either responsible to monitor, to troubleshoot the program, or to, you know, let's say maintain? The answer is no. <laughs> so uh, that whole uh, issue of skilled workforce is going to continue to be top of mind, and certain industry segments have greater needs on that versus others. Uh, and certainly the more communication and cooperation that we have between our workforce development pipeline, meaning the K through 12 as well as higher ed, so K through 16 system, with our business community, the better off that our particular uh, pipeline of prospective employees is going to be long term. Is it a solution that can be solved overnight? Of course not. Is it going to take time? Yes, it will. And a matter of fact, um, this Friday we're having kind of round two of our business and education summit where we're bringing together the education and the business communities. And this year in particular, in 2012, the first half of the program is dedicated towards a year ago when we got together, these were all the concerns and areas or issues, the grievances, let's say, that were aired. Here's what the response has been to date. Realizing that, uh, to use an analogy of the Titanic, it's impossible to turn one of these ships on a dime, so it takes time. But there has been progress in specific areas and specific initiatives that are ongoing and have been addressing those concerns, those grievances that were aired 12 months ago. Does it mean that everybody is uh, fat and happy and satisfied and complacent with the way that things are at? Of course not. But steps have been taken in the right direction and additional steps are on the horizon. And so part of uh, the message on Friday is going to address those things. And then more importantly, the back half is going to talk about some initiatives that are on the horizon. And more importantly, Manpower is going to give a presentation on a concept and um, a new method that they are advocating for for HR personnel to start using for identifying talent. And they're calling it the teachable fit model. I'm not an expert on it. I just know the surface on it. Essentially what it is, is it's encouraging HR staff to look at candidates in a different light. Instead of saying, we're the employer, this is our box, now fit the candidate inside of the box, and you either fit or you don't, they're encouraging 
the HR community to take a look at the skill sets and the core competencies of the applicant and make the transition of those skill sets and apply those into the openings that the company has. Manpower, I believe, based on their research, has come to the conclusion statistically, not just anecdotally, but statistically, that by doing this and by applying this teachable fit model, HR folks will be able to reduce turnover, be able to find better candidates that fit out of the gate, and more importantly, be able to find candidates that provide value to their company on day one instead of day 90. So uh, Teresa Carroll from uh, the Manpower office is going to give that presentation. And uh, it's, it's a powerful tool based on what we've heard from companies that are utilizing it. And I think it really has a lot of value for smaller companies. Let's face it, smaller companies today probably don't have um, dedicated HR staff. The HR director may be the CFO. It may be the janitor or the custodian. It may be the person in charge of logistics, depending mm -hmm. on the size of the company. So uh, for smaller companies, it probably has some more immediate fit. For the larger companies, uh, those that might be publicly owned, as an example, uh, they do their they do their own thing. But it may be another way for them to help localize what they do based on what the skill sets are of the current pipeline of, of applicants that are out there. Yet another approach and another tool uh, to help our HR community and to help our companies potentially, you know, become stronger by using this. Is it going to be easy to use? Of course not. Is there a learning curve? Yes, there is. Uh, but the good news is Manpower has used it. Uh, they're a large entity that operates globally, so it's not that they're going to launch something that doesn't have credibility and hasn't been stamped by their organization. So it's going to be an exciting uh, presentation, and we hope that there's uh, sufficient interest and, and demand for some sort of either group or individual follow-up from there. Is that something that's going to be open to the public, or is this something that's for economic development professionals? Or well, in, in theory, in to, theory, that sounds really yeah. interesting. Now. Yeah, in theory, it's open to the public. Uh, there were invitations that were sent out to companies directly, mm -hmm. and some of those invitations were based on last year's attendance list. Some of those are based on current distribution lists of organizations where we have, you know, a core group of companies that kind of fit this need. Uh, it's being co-sponsored by a variety of organizations, Blackhawk Human Resource Association, uh, the Southwest Workforce Development Board, Rock County 5.0, Blackhawk Tech, so on and so forth. So there's a variety of stakeholder groups and organizations that are, for lack of a better word, have the pulse and the connection to the business community. So hopefully the, the message has been distributed. Um, I haven't seen the current attendance, you know, RSVPs to date, but I suspect we'll probably have anywhere from 50 to 65 to 70 folks attend, which is, you know, not a bad number uh, given the fact that, A, it's on a Friday, B, it's a four-hour commitment that we're asking people to make because there's essentially four or five topics that will be talked about from 8 a.m. until noon. And so uh, we realize that people are busy, and obviously if they can't make it, uh, both the Blade Daily News and the Gazette will be there to cover it in some capacity. So if folks weren't able to be there, uh, there will be ample follow-up, whether it's through traditional media channels or whether it's through organizational communication. And where's this going to be? It will be held down at Blackhawk Tech okay. at the main central campus. So certainly there isn't, uh, there isn't any restrictions on the general public to attend. They just simply wanted to know on an RSVP headcount, but sure. you know it is much like a wedding or some other event. <laughs> folks right. commit to an RSVP and you've had that a 10 to 15% swing, you know, where folks say they're going to be there and something happens that they don't show up, but you also have others that didn't RSVP that, you know, invariably come in and take that open seat. So I think it will all work out. I think so. Excellent. Uh, James, is there anything else that you wanted to kind of get out there about Rock County economic development that people should know about? Yeah, I, I guess there's just a couple additional items I want to cover here, Yuri. Uh, first and foremost, from an information standpoint, from a data standpoint, from a trend standpoint, and more importantly, um, to answer the question, what's been going on in the area and why should I be concerned about it, I would draw your uh, listeners and viewers' attention to visit rockcountyalliance.com. That particular website is uh, our our economic development 
portal, for lack of a better word, for the county that takes a lot of the information and topics and tools that I briefly referenced today, it's all housed on there. And so whether somebody is just looking for a high level, uh, hey, what's going on in the area? We've got our Rock Ready Index, which is a quarterly index that we put out. Uh, there's quick, uh, you know, jumping off and launching pads right on the main page to that. Or if somebody wants to do a deep dive into what kind of fuels uh, these different categories and, and what are the different layers of statistics and information that kind of help speak to and, and document what's been happening in the marketplace, you can dive as deep as you know your oxygen tank wants to take you on there. So uh, that's one item. The other item is I would really encourage folks to jump on the media section on there. And if you're going to remember anything at all from today's uh, dialogue, rockcountyready.com. That's a vanity URL that essentially takes you right to the Rock County Alliance site, but it jumps you right to the media section. And once you're in the media section, there's a variety of topical headings that you can find out. Uh, click on uh, the media kit and or the Rock Ready Index icons. You'll find a lot of high-level information that talks about where we've been, where we are, where we're heading in terms of our economic landscape. And I think uh, folks will be either pleasantly surprised or extremely satisfied to find out that there are and have been and will continue to be good things going on in the marketplace. Although the information we're going to have to update because of some activity in the last three to four months, but let me just give you a snapshot of some things you're going to either read about or, or see when you're on there. From 2010 to 2012, we've had approximately 40 private sector economic development projects that have either been announced or have been completed throughout Rock County. Those represent existing businesses that have been expanding, existing, excuse me, new businesses or new investment that are brand new to the marketplace that have decided to put their money and to put their project here, as well as it represents new startups that have come to the market that are of significance. Um, in total, those 40 plus projects represent over $600 million in new capital investment. So brand new money that wasn't currently being spent in our area, either is or will be spent uh, based on those projects. And in total, those projects represent about 2.7 million square feet in uh, space. Some of that space was formerly vacant, as well as brand new, either constructed or renovated space. Those are big numbers. And last but not least, on the job side of the equation, uh, you know, you're looking at uh, over 1,600 new employment positions created or attributed specifically to those 40 plus projects. Again, when those projects come either, you know, online at full ops or initial startups or whatever it may be, again, these are numbers that were reported at a certain date and time. So there is some, you know, fluid nature and flux and uh, fluctuation there. But uh, thousands, I mean, you're talking 10,000. Uh, plus jobs that have been retained by all those projects as well. And so I think at times what happens is, is folks, depending on either their, uh, their personal situations or perhaps based on their political ideologies or perhaps based on uh, just uh, the indicators that they use to evaluate whether things are positive or negative in the economy, it sometimes these projects may get overshadowed by that. Right, wrong, or different? We're all creatures of habit. We process information. We get our news from respective sources, and we filter it accordingly. But there are and have been really good things going on. And just by way of uh, curiosity for you, as well as folks that you know are going to tune into this podcast, of those projects, uh, the lion's share of those have been anchored in Boyd and Janesville. And then if you slice it down another step further, a lion's share or the lion's share of those projects, anywhere from two-thirds to even up to 75% of those projects represent existing companies that have been expanding. So it, it goes back to the point that you need to take care of your existing customers first. And uh, collectively, we're extremely fortunate to have uh, not only a dedicated ED team, but more importantly, an extremely engaged business community and a business community that isn't afraid to make investments uh, in our marketplace. And obviously, they have to be driven by sound, reasonable, and, and uh, sustained uh, business considerations. And, and we're fortunate and, and blessed that these companies have decided to make these investments here instead of elsewhere. 
And I think it says a lot about not only the companies, but it says a lot about the area. Because if this wasn't a good place, or if it wasn't a place that was perceived to be stable, in an area that was perceived to be on the uh, cusp of not only continual diversification in terms of its economic base, but, but in terms of its growth opportunities, folks wouldn't be writing a check for 10, 15, 20, 30 million dollars to invest in a project here. That gives us all some hope that, well, for starters, somebody has 10, 20, 30 million dollars and then they're looking to invest it in Rock County. It's all about perspective, and I think a lot of our activity, uh, primarily through Rock County 5.0, has to been um, adjust that perspective, and we've spent a fair amount of time and money um, putting that message out to targeted audiences, and uh, we've been pleasantly surprised with the response that we've received. Uh, let's face it, the extended media continues to want to focus on one or two topical areas. Right. And they regurgitate those topics frequently, and sometimes more frequently than we'd like. And so we have an uphill battle when we're out there in terms of the messaging, in terms of the communications, because let's face it, everyone uses stereotypes. And again, they use those stereotypes to reach a conclusion that may or may not be accurate. So we spend an inordinate amount of, an inordinate amount of time dispelling this right-sizing expectations, creating the appropriate context about, you're right, here's what was reported on and here's what did happen. Right. But here's what is transpired from okay, that date if, forward. If, you, if you're going to bring that up, let me ask you that question. Um, over the last six months, leading, I don't know, three, four months, leading up to November, there's been an ordinate amount often in attention on Janesville. Do you feel that as economic development professional, Overall, it's positive to have so much attention, or does it, or does it have some negative connotation? Because, like you said, it does go to those one or two subjects, and we can wrap it up after that. Let me just uh, close this out. Sorry. Sure. Um, the short answer is the historical. I mean, is it as long as they spell your name right? Is that that's yeah? All you know, the old school thought was as long as your name's in the press. Fantastic. You know, at least you're getting but that's know, old additional. School, huh? It's old school. In today's environment, it's not only uh, the frequency, but it's also the context of the frequency. So to answer your question about, you know, the, the pre-election attention that we had with uh, Congressman Paul Ryan being on the, you know, the, the ticket for the Republican Party, I would say overall that it raised a different type of attention on the area. And... Our collective team, I think, did a real good job of trying to adjust the tone and adjust the perspective of the storyline that wanted to continually be spun by whoever was writing the article or covering the story. And I think we did a fair amount of, um, I think we had some good traction in terms of the amount of information and the amount of, uh, let's say, the rest of the story that we were able to provide. Did it receive, you know, top of the fold headline uh, type exposure? Of course not. But in a variety of those articles, if you read through them, there were threads in there. Sometimes they were more evident than others, uh, but there were some decent threads in there. Would we have liked to have had more opportunities to tell our story and more opportunities to frame up the dialogue? Of course. The reality is at least we got uh, the opportunity to be there. We got the opportunity to at least uh, present some additional information. And, and obviously, you know, there was the calm before the storm, as they say. Mm -hmm. And then after the election, a lot of that uh, extended exposure has dissipated. But at least we have contacts now. At least those folks know that when they call, they're going to be able to uh, reach somebody who can speak coherently and um, you know, efficiently and more importantly, uh, you know, have have their pulse on the local area when they want to ask questions about, hey, what's going on? And invariably, everybody wants to gravitate towards one or two topical themes, but uh, you will find that um, it's just like building relationships with, with any type of uh, industry segment. Over time, assuming there isn't a lot of staff turnover and assuming that uh, we get additional opportunities, we feel pretty confident that uh, we've at least you know, put the proverbial 
uh, appropriate spin. Let's face it, it's always going to be viewed as spin, but right. at least we have the opportunity to put our spin on it. And, and we you have still have the phone numbers and the contact information for all those people should a good project that worth the Exactly. Event. So we, we've, uh, a handful of them in particular, we've added that information into our distribution. So anytime there's positive press that happens, guess what? Boom. Right. They, Washington Post yep, and everybody else knows you betcha. about it. They get that type of information. I remember when CNN was here and uh, they did they took quite a bit of film, but uh, obviously had a short segment that got squeezed into. I've been pleasantly surprised when I send uh, that individual a note about, hey, here's some good stuff going on. You get a reply back that says, thanks for sharing it. Good to hear great news is going on. So, you know, again, it's a process of awareness. It's a process of education. It's a process of inf information. And, and, you know, as they say, where the chips are going to fall, they're going to fall. James, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're listening to Discover Janesville, and this is Yuri Rashkin. And that was conversation with Rock County Economic Development Director James Otterstein. Um, James, thank you very much, and uh, I hope uh, um, you enjoyed this conversation. It was great. Uh, next, a few announcements. First of all, there are Jack Awards, Janesville Area Creativity Awards, that are coming up on February uh, 16th. But first, on January 10th, at uh, 7 p.m. there will be announcements of who the nominees are. If you want to uh, find out and that perhaps if you're one of the nominees because there are a lot of awards and a lot of creative people in this town um, I think will be uh, pleasantly surprised to see recognized uh, with the nomination. Uh, there are bands, there are hair designers, uh, there are actors and actresses and theater productions and culinary artists uh, it will be just uh, uh, really a lot of fun, and uh, uh, we have our own awards. And of course, it is a fundraiser, uh, so you should know that some of the awards are uh, people's choice, and some of the awards are judged by a panel of qualified judges, and uh, our committee made kind of after a long discussion, we made some executive decisions on which uh, of the awards will be uh, people's choice and watch which of them will be judged. So, but either way, uh, nominations are going to be announced at Janesville Performing Arts Center on uh, January 10th, and uh, we hope to see you there. And then on uh, January, uh, February 16th, the awards themselves will be presented, and all of this is sponsored by the United Arts Alliance. Um, as you have heard during the announcements, there is a UAA jingle. Join the UAA. UAA stands for United Arts Alliance, and uh, um, it, uh, it is the, uh, the organization behind the Jingle Area Creativity Awards, as well as um, many other projects. And uh, I'm proud to be president of this <laughs> of this great group of people, frankly. So, uh, United Arts Alliance. Next, uh, Silent Film. I play music for Silent Film, and uh, I really enjoy doing it. It gives me a chance to kind of get some creativity out as if I haven't had enough. And um, so this, if you're listening to this uh, before January uh, 15th, I hope to see you at Raven's Wish on the Janesville Mile in uh, downtown Janesville. And uh, Raven's Wish is an art gallery, and if you haven't been there, you should be there. Uh, but uh, just in case, it is an awesome store with great selection of uh, unique stuff from our local area. Um, and uh, so you definitely should stop by Raven's Wish and also to check out the silent movie. What is the silent movie uh, going to be this time? Uh, let's start with that. It's going to be Charlie Chaplin, uh, The Gold Rush, uh, which is a hilarious movie that I happen to have seen throughout my life at various occasions, and I enjoy seeing it every time because I forget it just enough where I'm pleasantly surprised because there's so much funny stuff in it. In fact, Charlie Chaplin said that he wanted to be remembered for this particular movie, if nothing else. So, uh, stop by. We're going to start at 6.30 p.m. Um, and uh, uh, price, cost to get in. If you are a member of United Arts Alliance or if you're a member of Discover Janesville, then your entry is free. Um, however, if for everybody else, uh, the entrance is $5. So, Five bucks gets you Charlie Chaplin, Gold Ru The Gold Rush, 
with live piano accompaniment by yours truly. So there we go. Uh, friends of uh, Discover Janesville or just members of, of Discover Janesville, if you are interested in being a financial supporter of this program, uh, there are two ways to do it. First of all, I'd love to have you as a sponsor, and uh, uh, we'll you know get in touch at discoverjanesville at gmail dot com, and let's talk. But also, we have membership meetings, and uh, our next membership meeting is going to be coming up. Uh, here just a little bit later. So that's going to be at the house of uh, Kathy Myers, our, one of our correspondents, actually, as the uh, case may be. And uh, uh, we're going to be getting together there, um, trying to look up here. It's going to be, there we go, uh, Sunday, uh, January 20th. But you know what? Better than that, uh, send an email if you'd like to be there, if you'd like to be notified. Notified, discover Jamesville at gmail.com. All right. Um, next, what I need to mention is, ah, Packers. This is Discover James of Wisconsin, and this is all about Packers. Um, so right now, the third quarter has begun, and as this is being broadcast. So I doubt that there's anybody from Wisconsin currently ah. listening. In fact, I would like to set the record with this show for the lowest numbers of live listenership unless that would probably tell me that we're being heard from all over the world because if you're in Wisconsin, chances are you're watching Packers right now because why wouldn't you be? Um, but uh, today I was at Woodman's, our local fantastic uh, grocery store, although they're not a sponsor, so um, they were. I was at Woodman's, but apparently so was everybody else and it was really quite incredible. I've never been at the store that was that busy. Um, I think in my life because uh, Soviet Union was a whole other kind of thing uh, but to have a fully stocked grocery store maybe if I lived in Florida and people clear out before natural emergencies maybe it would have been something like that but here in Janesville just not used to it the store was entirely packed and uh, everyone was fairly peaceful but I, as I left uh, I wrote on Facebook that uh, there's an apocalypse going on at Woodman's uh, it's just, uh, I've never seen so many people there. And uh, people posted comments that apparently it was uh, not always friendly. Not always friendly. Um, that is that is difficult. I hope everyone, uh, you know, it's it's Saturday. It's Green Bay is playing. Packers are playing. And uh, it was about to begin snowing. In fact, as I was leaving, it started to snow. So it was a perfect storm. Everybody had to go to women's. Uh, next, I wanted to take a little bit of a deviation from uh, Janesville, frankly, and talk about uh, something I wrote uh, on my website, yurirashkin.com, and it is a, uh, my take on the anti-orphan politics that are going on in Russia right now, which I believe sends messages of intimidation, and it hurts orphans. Uh, I have a little bit of an insight into this, Basically, because I am from Russia and I lived there until I was 13, um, I still read Russian press and uh, communicate with my uh, relatives there, although I haven't been back actually since I left in 1988. Uh, so, uh, but I wanted to just give my take um, on this very difficult and unpleasant and kind of incredible issue. So, and there's more that I suppose I could say, so we'll see how this goes. Maybe I'll add more to this. But you can read it for yourself at www.yurirashkin.com. And uh, uh, it will be, uh, you know, if you have comments, it's always great to hear. So on this note, we are wrapping up the first episode of Discover Janesville of this uh, 2013. And... Uh, if you have questions, discover Janesville at gmail.com. If you'd like to check out the website, www.discoverjanesville, there you can find all the episodes cataloged uh, with all the specials, music, and everything else. Um, and then, of course, Facebook. I hope you like uh, this page on Facebook, Discover Janesville. And uh, thanks for listening. So, Discover Janesville.